England represents itself as a liberal democracy. It's in a security alliance with four other democracies. But it's having a hard time standing up to China. So whose side is New Zealand on? John Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern resigned as Prime Minister in January after almost six years in office. Officially, she resigned because of burnout. But her approval ratings had plummeted at home, jeopardizing her re-election prospects. Many people think she resigned so she didn't have to face defeat in the next election, which I can relate to. I hate losing, too, which is why once I become Supreme Leader for life, there won't be any elections after that. Problem solved. Internationally, Ardern was known as a liberal icon who was all about a politics of kindness, which, if you follow politics, sounds like an oxymoron. Kind politics is like a no-touch massage that's just a nap with company. Ardern promised that her Labor Party would lead a government of transformation now, if the Labor Party had taken on transforming avocado toast, that might have been doable. Throw on an egg, maybe some radishes. That's a transformed toast. But a whole country? No wonder they had to switch it to foundational change. There were some changes during her tenure, though. The country banned semi-automatic guns after the Christchurch shooting. The cost of living went up over 8% last year. Single-use plastics will be mostly banned by 2025. And... She almost got her name on a new cow fart tax. That bill didn't make it through Parliament by the time she left. Yes, in New Zealand, even cows have to pay for climate change. Honestly, I'd be okay with taxing some humans who fart, especially in airplanes. I don't care if we're 40,000 feet in the air. We're still living in a society. But one thing that didn't change under Ardern was New Zealand's cozy relationship with China. Now, you might think that given her progressive bona fides, Ardern would be vocal about China's human rights abuses. After all, empathy was kind of her thing. But her track record on calling out China for its human rights abuses was a solid F. That's not empathy, it's empathail. New Zealand did release a statement with Australia expressing grave concerns about China's treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. They had to tag along with Australia just to say they're concerned I've seen interventions with stronger language. And that was over drinking and not, you know, genocide. And on Hong Kong, the government released several statements expressing more concerns about the Chinese Communist Party taking it over. I assume the Uyghurs and Hong Kongers are also concerned that expressing concern is as far as New Zealand was willing to go. But Ardern's Labour Party made sure any mention of genocide was removed from a motion on Uyghur persecution before it was even debated in Parliament. And earlier last year, New Zealand bowed out of a joint statement condemning arrests in Hong Kong under the national security law. While it supported other countries' sanctions over Hong Kong, New Zealand didn't implement any itself. Because committing genocide and imprisoning political dissidents is one thing, but calling them out on it, that doesn't sound like the politics of empathy. Before a trip to China in 2019, Human Rights Watch called on Ardern to say something publicly about China's human rights abuses, which she didn't. For years, New Zealand has relied almost exclusively on private diplomacy on human rights, a practice Chinese officials prefer because it enables them to behave as if such discussions have never taken place at all. More important though, there's no loss of face. The Chinese Communist Party can't stand people calling out its human rights abuses publicly. Kind of like what I'm doing right now. So definitely don't share this video. Wouldn't want to upset the CCP now, would we? But that's actually the least of New Zealand's cowardice when it comes to China. I'll tell you more after the break. Welcome back. New Zealand is part of an intelligence sharing network called the Five Eyes. It was started after World War II and includes the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. For years now, New Zealand has been considered a weak link in the network because of its ties to China. And if we're being honest, 
also because of Thor, Love, and Thunder. How could they let Taika Waititi put out a stinker like that? Step up your game, New Zealand. Both New Zealand's Labour Party and National Party have had scandals involving Chinese spies in Parliament. If you want to know more, I'll leave a link to our episode on that down below. There have also been allegations of illegal Chinese money and influence in New Zealand's elections, again, in both of its main political parties. I know, this is shocking. Both rival political parties can actually agree on something? Well, that would be downright heartwarming if it wasn't corruption that they agreed on. In 2018, former CIA analyst Peter Mattis told U.S. lawmakers that both Australia and New Zealand have been compromised by Chinese influence in their governments. But he was particularly concerned about New Zealand because of how it reacted to the threat. He said in New Zealand, both the last Prime Minister, Bill English, and Jacinda Ardern have denied that there's a problem at all. I think that at some level, the Five Eyes, or the Four Eyes, needs to have a discussion about whether or not New Zealand can remain given this problem with the political core. And that's a tough discussion. On the one hand, can you trust New Zealand, who seems to have been compromised and not willing to admit it? But on the other hand, if you do kick them out, then the organization would be called Four Eyes. That just makes them sound like a bunch of dorks. This isn't just about Ardern, though. New Zealand's relationship with China has been problematic for years. Peter Mass mentioned former Prime Minister Bill English the leader of New Zealand's conservative National Party. When he was in office, he signed New Zealand up for China's Belt and Road Initiative. The reason most other Western countries didn't sign up is because it's a horrible deal and a trap. The idea is that the Belt and Road Initiative helps countries build up their infrastructure. China offers countries cheap loans, materials, and labor, which is especially attractive to poor countries that couldn't get loans otherwise. But that's where the gravy train ends. China has been known to install spyware in its infrastructure, to take over projects when the country can't pay back the loan, or build infrastructure that's so crappy the country can't even use it. Essentially, China is spying, trying to seize control, and building low-quality products. Who could have guessed that would have happened? That's like renting an Airbnb from Amber Heard and being shocked to find the bedsheets aren't clean. Now, nothing has ever come of New Zealand's Belt and Road Agreement except some paper. However, under Ardern, the government didn't stop it from auto-renewing last year, so maybe there's a chance something will happen with it. I don't know, New Zealand. This isn't something you can really go halvesies on. You're either in China's pocket or you're in the Five Eyes. You can't have your transformed avocado toast and eat it too. But trade relations between China and New Zealand get even chummier than that. I'll explain why this is such a problem right after the break. Welcome back. In 2008, New Zealand Labour Prime Minister Helen Clark signed a free trade agreement with China. Ardern's government signed a revised free trade agreement again in 2021. So while New Zealand is already on its second round of a trade deal with China, and it says it's working on one with the EU, it doesn't have anything with the US. The reason I mention this is because New Zealand very conspicuously says that at the top of the government's trade website. It's almost like they're proud they have a better trade relationship with China than the US. Which is kind of like being proud that instead of using the postal service, you send all your mail via courier penguin. Man, it's no wonder people want them out of the five eyes. That's like spitting in the United States eye and then sharing it on social media. New Zealand was also the first Western country to support China's membership into the World Trade Organization, which turned out to be great for China, but mostly a disaster for the rest of the world. Which is kind of the MO for all of China's policies. Does New Zealand like China because they're into bad boys or something? Grow up, New Zealand. Bad boys might be fun to date, but they'll never make a good long-term partner. And yet New Zealand has become so totally dependent on China. China is New Zealand's biggest trading partner, and by a lot. Last year, China bought almost a quarter of all of New Zealand's exports. Agricultural products like meat and dairy are New Zealand's biggest exports, besides underwhelming Taika Waititi films. China buys up about a third of all of New Zealand's dairy exports, and about 40% of its meat. Essentially, China 
has made itself the center of New Zealand's economy, which is a huge reason for New Zealand's politicians to keep their mouths shut about China's human rights abuses. Oh, so kind politics is actually short for kinda short-sighted politics, gotcha. New Zealand's in a major cost of living crisis, and it's also dealing with a weak economy thanks to COVID. If China were to pull the plug on New Zealand's imports right now, it would be devastating to the economy. As the head of the New Zealand's International Business Forum put it, New Zealand has a lot at stake in this relationship. It has no domestic market to rely on, and it can't replace Chinese consumption anywhere else in the world. So yeah, China has New Zealand between a rock and a hard place. Which is some surprise because A, that's what China does, and B, New Zealand is like 90% rocks and hard places. Now, it's not like some abstract fear that China will use trade to retaliate if New Zealand says things Beijing doesn't like. New Zealand watched China do exactly that to Australia in 2020, after Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison called for an independent investigation into the origins of COVID. China put an unofficial trade ban on Australian wine, lobsters, timber, barley, and coal. I'm not sure if China thought this ban would somehow fly under the radar, but nothing says guilty like, I'm gonna punish you for trying to investigate me. Now, New Zealand exports are also a big deal for China. At one point, China said New Zealand made up half of its dairy imports. For more on why China's so crazy about New Zealand dairy, check out this interview we did with a New Zealand farmer. I'll put a link to that in the description below. But as you can see, New Zealand has basically joined itself at the hip to China. And this is why the government walks on eggshells when it says anything the Chinese regime might consider sensitive. Things like, they're actively committing genocide. Whoops. Again, definitely don't want to share this video. Wouldn't want to upset the Chinese Communist Party, would you? When New Zealand said it wanted its foreign policy to be separate from the Five Eyes, many people read this as New Zealand saying it wouldn't be joining the U.S. coalition against China anytime soon. Even when talking about China's blatant aggression in the region, Ardern euphemistically called it assertiveness. And instead of saying China's a trade threat, she framed the need to diversify the countries New Zealand sells to as being about resilience. Those are some impressive euphemisms. That's like calling a rear naked choke a hug with benefits. New Zealand's foreign minister was a little more blunt though. She predicted New Zealand would find itself at the center of a trade storm with China and warned exporters to start finding other markets. But Ardern is out of office now. And you're probably wondering what the new prime minister's take on China is. Well, until the next election in October, Labor Party leader Chris Hipkins is the prime minister. There was some optimism at the start that he would do better at standing up to China, saying he'll voice disagreements, but in the same breath, he called the relationship very important. And he said a trip to China is a high priority. I'm not mad, New Zealand. I'm not even disappointed. Because to be disappointed, I'd need to be surprised. Oh, and he also said our foreign policy position hasn't changed just because there's a change of prime minister. Because in New Zealand, both political parties actually agree on corruption. So yeah, don't hold your breath. New Zealand's gonna do anything to stand up to China anytime soon. At least not unless it's forced to. You know, maybe being called four eyes isn't so bad after all. And now it's time for me to answer a question from a fan who supports China Uncensored the crowdfunding platform Patreon, or the social media platform Locals. Shinny the Pooh on Patreon asks, if China decides to invade Taiwan and the U.S. comes to Taiwan's aid, what would happen to all the Chinese nationals living in the U.S.? Remember what Roosevelt did following the Pearl Harbor attack? Well, Shinny, if you're worried that the U.S. is gonna round up Chinese nationals or Chinese Americans and put them into internment camps like in World War II, I don't think it's gonna to come to that. Even if the US actually gets into a war with China. For one, those internment camps were declared unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court in 2018. Okay, so it took them a while. But there's also no reason for the US government to round people up into camps to make sure they're not a threat to national security. This is the 21st century. The US government can just spy on everyone's phones instead. Thanks for your question and your support, Shinny the Pooh. 
Chen and Censored is able to keep making videos like this because of viewers like you. Visit patreon.com slash China Uncensored to contribute on the crowdfunding website, Patreon, or go to chinancensored.locals.com to join us on the exclusive social media site, Locals. We rely on you to keep making great episodes. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.